Gentlemen, it is great to have you here for the Leadership Series. I truly appreciate um, your participating. Um, this is digital media, uh, getting positive results is what, uh, what this panel is being called. And uh, I'd like to just start with introductions. So um, let's go with our, our faceless wonder first because he's not on video. Uh, Jeff, can you introduce yourself, where you're from, etc.? Yeah, Jeff Walker, and I'm calling in from Buffalo, New York, where it's a brisk minus five today. Uh, I am the executive vice president and general manager for Fisher Price. Sean. Uh, this is a Sean Atkins uh, from, from the sunny Los Angeles. Uh, I'm actually a fellow Trojan with Jeff, uh, but I am the general manager and executive vice president of digital and strategy for Discovery Communications. And Fabrizio. Um, hello, everybody. Fabrizio Busso Campana, FAP for short. I am in sunny, delicious South Florida, which is 72 degrees, and I am a partner at N2S Marketing Group. Awesome. And I'm Mark Sadovnik, CEO of uh, the executive search firm Sadovnik Partners, um, sharing the beautiful uh, Los Angeles weather with Sean. Uh, but I must say, I did pick up this cold in Boston Strong recently, so I, I appreciate them for sharing. Um, <laughs> Hey, let's, uh, let's get right into it. Um, we're talking about digital media. Um, maybe I'll start with Sean, if I can, on this one. Um, it keeps coming up with my clients, uh, customer experience. Obviously very important. It always has been, but it's really been recognized more uh, by successful businesses you know, recently. Um, how do you see this with future sophistication and the influences of online comments shaping up with respect to customers? Yeah, look, I think part of the reason you see uh, customer experience really uh, becoming a big deal is really for sort of two reasons. One, um, because digital sort of disintermediates disintermedi almost every part of the business model, uh, it allows customer experience to be some way you can differentiate it at a level that's sort of easier to achieve economically than it has been historically when you kind of lo looked at large industries. The second uh, thing that I think makes it a, a critical thing is that the velocity by which your consumers can speak to the public out loud and to one another is at a level we just sort of had historically hadn't had to deal with, right? Uh, in the media business, we used to talk about, you know, people might stand in the line to watch a movie and say, as they walk out, I don't like that movie, and maybe five people hear them. Now, they can immediately be in the movie theater and literally be tweeting real time, I don't like that movie. And literally hundreds of thousands of millions of people can, can magnify that. So that's sort of raw authenticity with your with potential consumers has sort of forced people like you don't have an option anymore you have to embrace that um, and to have great consumer experience you sort of suffer pretty dire consequences and we see some great examples that have happened to that with some of the corporations lately out there hey jeff with respect to that you have a interesting customer base it's it's parents and kids right how do, uh, how do you see this this yeah area? i mean well for us it's it's the millennial mom is our core demo and uh I think this consumer more than any others in the past really expects to have a say in how companies, products, brands uh, are, are designing, developing, creating different different uh, things. And I, I think that what we've really learned is that if you can get that commentary from real parents, it can actually be more powerful than a brand telling its own story. Yeah. That's awesome. And from your perspective, Fabrizio, uh, you consult with a lot of clients, diverse industries. What's your insight on this? Well, I, I benefit from having been raised in the hospitality business. And the hospitality business um, lives strictly by reputation. Because, you know, at the end of the day, there's only so much product and service differentiation you can have. And at the end of the day, it really is, you know, it's all about the last mile. Because you can have, you know, the most beautiful hotel, the most beautiful ship, but you know, you always go back to, you know, the the old adage of you'd rather be at a five star restaurant with crappy service or at a mediocre restaurant but the service is superb. You know, the repeat rate is always going to be where you get the superb service with, uh, you know, with the other folks that rather go the other way. Um, it's been very interesting because, you know, for us, we were really the first industry that that uh, had to had to basically take a step back and several departments became completely disenfranchised to use one of Sean's phrases because the customer just basically skipped hop over them and went straight to the source 
You know, like, for example, on the ships, you used to get off the ship, you had a common card, then it would be taken, it would be scanned in, filled in, yada, yada. Now it's, you know, now you have people that, you know, if you're on the new generation ships, you know, something happens, and actually this happened last week with Disney, they'll tweet from the ship because they're 400 miles out in the open sea, and something goes wrong, and next thing you know, you have a media storm. So it's... Uh, you know, it's it's very very interesting because we've gone from a world of of really controlling the experience and doing literally damage control and collateral damage to one where you have to be proactive and manage the reactiveness of of you know everybody in the organization and everything is a moment of truth and as I've mentioned before. One of the hardest things that, particularly when it comes to management, when we're consulting our clients, is the fact that that management by nature is neither meek nor humble nor accustomed to be naked nor transparent. And, you know, that's what customer service is all about. Because, you know, we started the conversation before we started recording about, you know, GoDaddy's debacle with the puppy, the puppy falling off the truck. Okay, they basically, you know, they were getting so many complaints that they crashed the email server at GoDaddy, which is tragic, crashing the email server at GoDaddy. And that was in 24 hours. So it's, it's definitely something that's more and more important because the, there, there is no distance between the touch points. You know, I've, I've heard a lot of rumbles, and I'm not Mr. Tech, but I, I hear a lot from, from, uh, from clients and management about messaging apps. Um, speaking of, of being involved in digital media, social media, but messaging apps actually taking over from social networks, which I find fascinating. There's WhatsApp, which was sold for a gazillion dollars. There's Tango, there's Line in Japan. I saw there's WeChat in China. There's a bunch of others. And they all have like millions, way more than I imagined, of users already. Um, let's go to you, you Sean. Um, is, that, is that the future? And I mean, is Facebook going to lose ground to these? And how does that impact or how do you take advantage of that? Uh, in your position? Yeah, look, uh, the, the velocity of digital is such that sooner or later, uh, I've always believed you sort of go through a cycle where um, as you get into early adopters, you sort of need super aggregators to come along to kind of get enough of that audience so you can build a business around it. And as that business starts to mature, and I'm sure Jeff could talk about this in terms of his experience on the consumer products and toy side, you start to identify more and more you know, ne niches within that kind of first aggregation that we call kind of the super niches you start breaking about. Okay, well, now I'm going to break out women and men out from the early adopters and millennials out from that. And then as it goes even further and there's mass adoption, you get into like super niches. Like I'm only speaking to basketball fans in Belize, right? You can get really narrow. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of it, that behavior in terms of targeting consumers is really follows the same thread from a product perspective because product development in a absolute sense is pretty inexpensive in a digital economy in, in, you know, versus like building a plant for Intel to build chips or, or the like. And so you have the ability as soon as you find one of those niches to get into them. So what, what, what messaging apps are, are just sort of a sub feature that Facebook used to deliver. Right. And, and you sort of, you see that accelerating. So, you know, Yahoo used to be everything and then people wanted to be in a social network and then and then from a social network now they just want a really defined just one component of that social network which is sort of the ability to mass communicate quickly. And so you see that explosion uh, in, in those apps into the hundreds of millions. I think what remains to be seen uh, is how do you build businesses on them. I'm not that concerned about it in the in the macro sense because We've had that same question at every stage of a new sort of consumer touch point in digital is like, oh, my God, portals. How do you build a business there? Oh, my God, social. How do you build a business there? Um, it's more concerning just the velocity at which these introductions come and that if you're, if you're a business uh, that has consumer touch points, which ones do you engage with at what period of time? And then how do you build either the right consumer marketing case or the right uh, business case and operationalize it? That's interesting. Jeff, do you – do you guys talk about messaging apps? Do you use them? Is there an impact on? Yeah, on I, mean, I, I think we, we look at, a, at a, a number of the different platforms that are coming up and the ones that are relevant and for us, the scalability of each one. You know, we look at Facebook. It's not going away, but it plays different roles for different generations and how the millennials use it is very different than kind of how the Gen Xers are using it. And that younger generation, it's more, I, I, I believe Facebook is more of a, a place that, 
gathers information and, and messaging apps and the direct connections to the friends and families. And so right. it's very different. Um, when we look at some of these new up and coming platforms, a Snapchat, the WhatsApp, I, I think where I look at it is when does it build critical mass that it's meaningful enough? And then two, how do brands actually interact to consumers in an authentic way on these new platforms? Because uh, you can't, from a budget perspective, really go out and try to attack every single new one that comes in, but you have to be careful and cognizant of them as they're coming in and what the consumers are doing on each one. Right. You know, that's a great, it's a great point with respect to leadership because, and I'll throw this one to you, Fab, on, on that is um, a lot of executives, and I think we've all talked about this at one point or another, are sometimes overwhelmed as to how to take on all this stuff. And you're both saying, you don't really have to, you have to really focus on what's the best for you. Is that your thought as well, Fabrizio? Yeah, I think that, uh, not I think, I firmly believe that um, really in today's, you know, digital disruptive um, maelstrom of, of, of technologies that, that are out and continuously, you know, hitting us from every which, which corner, um, leadership really needs to focus, at least this is what we counsel, on a couple of key, key points. More than any other time before, because people know that there are technologies to connect, people want to connect because people need to belong. So you need to be, out to, to be on the lookout for technologies that allow those connections where people can relate, mm -hmm. where people can aggregate, and people, where basically people can integrate into communities. Now, when we look at the like, uh, the like of these, these messaging apps, a lot of them basically were, you know, are grew to the dimensions that, had, that they have grown. Um, honestly, as a result of the fact of, you know, people wanting to screw the phone company because, you know, somebody was in China, somebody was in India, you know, they want to talk. Why should I even pay, you know, a cheap IP phone when I can actually do it on on on, on WeChat or We or Snapchat? There's so many different communication channels, but the underlying, the truly the underlying thing. People need to remain connected. They need to have, they, there is this amazing sense of belonging and me too-ness, okay? And it's not, you know, that, that, that phrase that a lot of younger people don't understand, you know, the, the, you know, the world is a village. People don't understand that concept in the world. I mean, truly, it's, it, it's really that, that's what leadership needs to focus on. So, you know, whether you use it for mass communication, for a mass purpose, or for a niche person, purpose, those are the keys of element, at least from what we have found and we continue to find over and over and over and over. You know, what we see in, uh, in the talent acquisition business, if you will, of executive search, including on boards, is that um, a few things, that um, management a lot of times looks into Facebook to deselect candidates, often. Hmm. Um, but even more so, management's looking on how people interact and are they publishing good information? Are they engaging about good conversations? Are they, um, are they, are, are they associated with the quote unquote right people, et cetera? And starting to analyze that quite a bit as to, um, you know, the value of people that they're, they're looking to recruit. Um, you know, on, um, on another aspect here with Super Bowl coming up and very expensive advertising, um, that's coming. I, I've seen a lot of times that uh, from clients that they're they're worried that people watching TV are not watching their commercials. They're going on to their their iPhone or this that or God knows where they're going. So now they're actually um, having a, some kind of interaction related to the commercial that's on TV that's going to their phones at the same time. Um, do you guys know anything about that? Have, have you is that been talked about in your companies about aligning the uh, mobile? media with the, with TV, et cetera? Uh, Sean, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. We actually, we've done a lot of experimentation and investigation of what we call kind of second screen. Uh, and the, the, the challenge and opportunity is exactly what you said, Mark, is that people watching television, uh, or I should probably be clear, watching a large 50 inch square in their living room, right? Because television is any, <laughs> on any device. Um, as a focal point of the living room is really dynamically changed, right? The focal point for most of us, it was the, you know, electronic fireplace. It was where we gathered to have a social experience. That social experience is still happening, but it's happening at an individual level. It's sort of how the, the Kindle created the privacy of the book. I always say that Fifty Shades of Grey would have never been created if everybody had to have that cover sitting 
sitting in in, in the uh, subway. But once you bought it on a Kindle, no one has any idea what you're reading. And sort of differences right. are starting that with television. But the social component we've expected, the water cooler, is still there. It's just happening generally on Facebook, on Twitter, um, depending on how, how engaged people are. And we've also seen that people's engagement with the type of content dictates how engaged they'd be with some second grade experience. So a great example, sports, super passionate, super data intensive. It adds to the experience to be able to pull up information. Like I know myself, I'm watching an, I'm watching a football game. I've got the watch ESPN app and I'm looking at all the statistics because it makes that experience better. But if I'm watching something like, you know, uh, a frivolous reality TV show or, you know, like a sitcom that I don't have to be fully focused on. I'm probably answering my emails or reading my Twitter news stream and then it doesn't work as well. So it, it, there's no one solution to what works in second screen, but you do have to be cognizant that like with most things, it is the large platforms that aggregate real time audiences that still have the most power and is generally not second screen applications that we've seen out there like glue, get glue and the like that are really driving those kind of businesses. Well, um, I'll come back to Jeff in a minute because I want to ask him a double question. Fab, any any comments on on that part? Um, I think that that so far of all these, you know, second, third screen, and in, instant screen campaigns that I have seen out there, and um, you know, I think that we're all fans of of uh, college football. I personally prefer college football versus pro ball. Um, I don't know if anybody saw the the Ohio State Auburn, um, Alabama game and all state strat strategy that they pretty much had uh, pretty much about one fourth of all the airspace uh, during the game. Well, their their whole thing was built around this one character, Mayhem. You know, because you have to insure against Mayhem, and it was basically all in and around social media. But they leveraged all channels to the hill. I mean, if you have a chance, you should really go and look at it. But basically it was a commercial where a guy says, Hey, I'm mayhem. And I just saw that John and Mindy, you know, did the hashtag on vacation. So all of a sudden the commercial shows that he's in their house as a thief and he's basically selling their stuff on auction as free as can be. Okay. And all of the ads are hashtag, hashtag, uh, great deal, hashtag, you know, flat screen TV. Allstate went as far as creating not only a Facebook presence, but huge Twitter trends, okay? But they had a website where they actually auctioned one of each one of the things that he was advertising while they were doing the TV commercials. By far, the single most successful fully integrated cross-platform campaign that I know of, and I mean, Sean, I'm sure that you swallow reports left and right on stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, it, it was huge. It was huge. People were talking as much about that commercial as they were about the game. Well, I guess, uh, I guess, Jeff, that means we're all in good hands, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, Jeff, I want you to comment on that. But in relation to that, the infamous Generation Z, I guess they're Gen Z, they're calling now, who are all the kids who are just growing up with mobile everything. Um, and that's all they're used to. And, uh, you know, we're going to start feeling like Neanderthals compared to uh, compared to, you know, with what they're doing. So how do you, what's your insight on what, what uh, Sean and, and Fab have talked about, but also the whole Gen Z generation that's, is there a different strategy for them based on what they're growing up with? Oh yeah, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I, I build on Sean a little bit on the second screen. I mean, I think the amazing part is how live events and, not, and sports, but even, even Obama's State of the Union had a live Twitter feed during it. It was in some ways more interesting to, watch than to just hear the scripted speech being given and so uh everyone's everyone's embracing kind of the dual screen the second screen uh uh execution that's going on out there how kids i, I think kids are growing up in in a seamless uh interconnected integration of technology and everything they do in their life and i think we the data we get is there's almost it's all it's four devices at once with with a lot of younger kids they have their iPhone on, they have an app or a laptop and the computer's noise in the back or the TV is noise in the background or they're watching it simultaneous to playing other games. So it's really how do you, uh, uh, you used to have to sit down at your computer and find time to do things. Now these mini some supercomputers are just sitting in their laps. So we have to kind of figure out how to integrate into that. 
and yeah, it's a, sorry, go ahead. No, and, and how you communicate and, and talk to the kids and, and uh, integrate your brands into that story. Yeah, I find it, I find it fascinating. Um, on, a, on a last point, um, I just want to respect your guys' time. You know, one of the biggest things coming up now is wearables, as, as we all know, and uh, trying to supposedly keep us fit, etc. cetera. They're, they're, you know, you know, they're not coming, they're here. I see a lot of people wearing it, and they're telling me how many steps they've taken that day, which is really good information to have. Um, you know, does this create new strategies and opportunities for, for each of you? Um, I'll go back to Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. We're we're kicking off a concept called Nursery of the Future, uh, and it really is designed around wearable tech and giving moms more insights into what their kids are doing uh, and the data they need. What we're trying to figure out is what's useful and what's too much. And I think there's a balancing act as you go into it. How about you, Sean? Yeah, look, uh, I would broaden it out to not just wearables, but to the Internet of Things, as we sort of talk about, which is computing power, uh, as Jeff sort of uh, just said, is gone so cheap and sensor power is so prolific that the interesting things to me aren't necessarily specifically wearables. I have my own right now, which I'm wearing. Um, but it is when we get it much more intelligent about managing the data we can get out of them, in a world where you can get all sorts of sensors, it's really about connecting that, that information. So in Jeff's point, like the nursery of the future, you know, there is on, uh, on my app like my drop cam that lets me see my kids, right? There's also like my health and fitness app that says how – Physical. There's my schedule that says how stressed out I am. There's my basis that's saying what my heart rate is. None of those talk to each other, right? But if that data was really working, you'd be able to have a moment that said, hey, you know, um, you know, Sean, we noticed you didn't get enough time in with your children today, and we see that they're home. If you leave now via this traffic route, you'll get it, you'll get it in. That's useful to me. Where where all those disparate data sources in and of themselves, I can't put that, you know, I, I can't put it together. But I think that future is where it gets exciting and that's where we're getting to because you just can't, you can't even run out of scenarios if you start thinking of like what that world could be. Even if you just picked up your phone and said, what if every one of the apps I had here was aware of the other and someone had the data to connect them? What sort of interesting things could be achieved for you? So it kind of, Fab, it kind of goes back to the beginning of this panel, um, customer experience, the wearables and all these uh contraptions, if I could call them that, um, working together to give us the better, best experience. Yeah, uh, definitely. It's, it's, you know, it's when you manage to achieve something that is the sum of ubiquitousness, um, instantaneity, which is part of ubiquitousness, connectivity, um, you know, and really and relevance to the individual experience particularly as it relates to defined circles of uh, to the far, find circles of connection and even circles of trust um, I think it's very very interesting I had the experience to go up to Corning's factories uh, in upstate New York um, that's right by your neck of the woods uh, Jeff and I actually saw a full, uh, smart house that was built with Corning's smart class where basically they have sensors so as you're walking around the house Hold it. okay you actually time. have you know you actually have the, uh, the sensors that are able to tell where you are and the information follows you it was one of the most amazing things that I have ever seen and I was like, you know what, I can get into that. Because then the cherry on the demo was the fact that they had connected a car. And when you got in the car, basically everything followed you in the car. I was like, this is the catch me out and then some. <laughs> well, um, it's great stuff. You know, you know, the best thing I get out of this is, one of the best things is, um, you know, we don't need to be overwhelmed. We can embrace it as all, you know, as... Uh, how it could, you know, make our lives better, you know, managing our time, managing our businesses, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, we do a lot of board searches. I would absolutely recommend all three of you for good board positions. Thank you. No doubt about it. Um, hey, gentlemen, thank you so much. I know we could go on forever, but uh, your insight is, is fantastic. I really appreciate it. And so is our business audience. So uh, 
Have a good rest of the day. Jeff, keep warm in Buffalo. Thank you. Go Seattle. And I hope to see you all soon. Jeff, thanks, thanks for having us, Have a nice day. Take care. Bye-bye.